not only did I make the mistake of doing a feature film as my first film, as opposed to what mm. you're told to do, and that is make a short film first, I also made the toughest kind of film in the world to make, and it's called a first person documentary. Hello, my name is Hobart, and I very much enjoyed this conversation with Jonathan Holliff, the director of the film My Father and the Man in Black. It's a documentary about his father, Saul, who was a longtime manager of Johnny Cash, and I truly believe that he was the reason behind their success together. I learned a lot about Johnny Cash while researching this topic, but surprisingly, I learned a little bit about it myself as well. What was your experience in Hollywood before you found the storage locker? Sure. Well, actually, I got my start in Toronto at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC. Uh, I worked in um, live television, um, specializing in award shows and music specials. I worked on the NHL awards for many years. And in 1991, the host of the NHL awards was Alan Thicke. Uh, you might remember him as the star of Growing Pains. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in Hollywood, obviously. And uh, he invited me to uh, to come work for him in, in Los Angeles for the last season of Growing Pains. And uh, that eventually led to uh, dual Canadian-American citizenship and work in television on both sides of the border. When your father had killed himself, you came across a storage locker with a surprising amount of, of uh, memorabilia from Johnny Cash. What was that experience like? Right. Um, I was still in California at the time when the phone rang and it was my mother telling me that, that my father had uh, ended his life. And uh, he and I had been estranged for many years at that point. Um, you know, the occasional note in a letter, uh, but no phone calls, no real visits, very sparse. And uh, it really, you know, was a gut punch. I, I wasn't uh, prepared for it. And um, what really troubled me at the time was learning that he, you know, purposely committed suicide, but didn't leave his sons a note. Um, and so that was unfinished business. And um, speaking of business, I had a business um, at that point uh, doing celebrity endorsements uh, in Hollywood. And I basically, um, sold it to my partners and um, and headed for Canada to look in on my mom and uh, just kind of um, decompress and, and think things over. And that was when she told me about this storage locker. Um, Saul had kept a storage locker for many years. People do that. It wasn't uh, a secret and it wasn't, um, you know, to hide anything. It was just where he kept the things that, you know, would clutter the house so uh, yeah exactly and um i uh, my mother told me about it gave me the keys and asked me um to clean it out and uh because i knew that would mean you know going through whatever was inside and i wasn't really ready to face my father's death at that particular time uh, i just let it sit and uh, it was wintertime in Canada, and a new movie happened to be out in theaters called Walk the Line. And of course, I went to see the movie. And um, while I was watching the movie, I realized really for the first time that Johnny Cash was famously arrested the year I was born. And I started to think maybe I had been too hard on my father, you know, shit was going down. And um, maybe I needed to um, understand him better if I could. So I literally went straight from the movie theater at night uh, to a storage locker in winter. So it was very cold inside. And I found what appeared to be just a bunch of dusty old banker's boxes with files in them, an old vacuum cleaner, an old reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, and other uh, uh, odds and ends. 
And when I started to open the boxes uh, that were just marked cash, it's not like they had any dates on them. Hmm. Um, it turned out to be basically everything that he kept from his years managing Johnny Cash that he felt was important for one reason or another. So it was um, an emotional experience and a real surprise. It was kind of like a, a gold mine when you consider that behind the boxes, I found gold records, including the gold records for Folsom Prison, Ring of Fire, and really quite uniquely, the gold 45 for a boy named Sue. Yeah, I saw that in the documentary. Uh, that was actually really neat. Uh, he had a lot of them. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Jonathan, in, uh, in the music business, um, the manager also gets a gold record when the artist does. I should, I used to think that only the manager did. And then the artist, like, I don't know, earned it, I guess, you know, but I, I always thought the manager had it. Too. I'll tell you something else too. In those days, they were actually dipped in gold. They were gold leaf. So, um, you know, they were, uh, they didn't stand up great to time. These were really well taken care of. They were in a box and uh, the frames were still intact, but um, they're not like the bulletproof plastic in, in case things you see today. Mm -hmm. uh, how long did it take you to go through everything uh, before, I guess, being comfortable that you actually have a gist of everything that was there? Yeah, well, you know, that's, um, there's, there's a couple of answers to that question. It took seven years to make the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I even thought of making a movie, uh, this was really a personal exploration on my part. I was trying to find um, a way to um, uh, to make peace with my father and to see if there was anything in what these were important files that might have included his kids, you know, where my brother and I represented in this uh, in the storage locker materials. Um, the answer is no. I, the family photos and things like that would be found later in my mother's care. Mm. But before you, I could even, um, and again, I wasn't, I'm not a writer. In fact, my mother saw me writing notes one day. I didn't want to bring the material home at that point because my mother had just lost her husband and I didn't want to unbox the past right in front of her on her living room floor. Mm -hmm. But she found some notes I had made and she said, you know, you should make, you should write a book. And I said, but mom, I'm not a writer. Um, and so what I was really doing was trying to, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was writing in the sense that the first thing you have to do, particularly, particularly when it comes to documentaries, is you have to um, organize the story. And as I said earlier, there weren't exactly dates on everything or, you know, big red arrows pointing to the X that marks the spot about mm -hmm. what's really important and how it fits in with all of the other stuff. So uh, the first two years I spent literally, uh, and I did finally unbox the stuff at, at my mother's uh, home, um, on the floor in five different rooms and just started making piles. And uh, then I put everything into a database and reference scanned all of the material. And that's all part of the process in trying to organize the story elements uh, to you know, see what structure emerges. Um, but as I said, it took uh, seven years from beginning to end to, to deliver the film. I understand. I remember in the documentary, you, you had seemed to have found a, a contact list of your dad and uh, you were going through it. Uh, how many people did you try calling on that? Did that take a long time itself? Yeah. And, you know, that's basically um, documentary filmmaking 101. You want to uh, do as many interviews as you can with people who were, you know, in the room. Um, however, it's important to note that uh, this film was unusual for a documentary in the sense that we didn't have any talking heads. If you remember seeing the film, this isn't your typical, you know, talking head 
Ken Burns documentary. Yeah, which I actually very, I, I want to interrupt. I'm sorry. I very much enjoyed that. I have oh. pet peeves on documentaries. I, I really enjoyed your creativity. And it was almost as if you're watching a movie more than it is watching a documentary. And I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of how you did it. Well, thank you very much. I really wanted it to feel like a movie, not because I thought it was necessarily worth being a movie, but mm -hmm. because, well, for example, I shot 35 millimeter film. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I did that and remember, this was 10 years ago, and uh, the RED camera had just been in Toronto for about a year, and I didn't, and I used, much to my regret, overused uh, what they call dramatic recreations. Now, mm -hmm. remember, this is without sound. We're not talking about actors delivering lines on camera, but actors pantomiming the action in certain cases under Saul or Johnny's voices. And I thought, if I use video, it'll look like an episode of America's Most Wanted. And I didn't want that canned video, you know, back 10 years ago, barely full HD look with no kind of depth of field or film grain to it. Mm. So I, like a naive um, and stupid first time filmmaker, um, insisted on shooting film. It's really funny. You say that, uh, first time filmmaker, it was, it was, I'm sure it was very expensive to find the film as well. This is an outdated industry. Is, like, do, does Hollywood still shoot in film today? Well, they do, but you know, it's funny because not very much and uh, very, very rarely, but, um, at the time we went into production, uh, Kodak was going out of business, which was good mm -hmm. news for me because uh, I still had my place in, in LA and I was shooting the film in Toronto, but I was in LA for whatever reason at the time. And I was able to, you know, pitch Kodak in donating the film uh, for the movie and um, had to basically put it in the trunk and drive it to Canada. I back to that contact list, uh, you know, you're saying that's it's 101, you know, and making a documentary. That's actually what people were doing for you before you found the storage unit. You know, when when after your father passed, you kept getting calls asking like, hey, is there anything there? Do you know anything and everything? So that makes sense. Yeah. You, yeah, you actually live. You were on both ends of that during this. And that's part of the reason why um, I thought this could be a feature documentary. Remember. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, this is before I went through the material, mm -hmm. all I could really remember about growing up with Johnny Cash were the memories of a child. And uh, I knew the, you know, the main bullet points of what my dad was doing for Johnny, but I didn't know the details. So at the time, I, the first question I asked myself was who would care about mm -hmm. this story? Who cares about the guy behind the guy? And um, then the phone started ringing. And uh, the reason why the phone started ringing was because a guy in London, Ontario, my hometown, wrote an article for the newspaper um, that basically had the headline, Saul Holliff deserves role in Walk the Line. And the takeaway message was, how can they make a movie about Johnny Cash and not talk about Saul Holliff? And people all across Canada saw the story, clipped it out. This is 10 years ago, remember? You know, mm -hmm. people were, you know, still using snail mail. <laughs> and they were mailing them copies to my mother uh, saying, you know, did you see this? And if not, check this out. And so... I was, you know, surprised and it fueled me even more, of course, to understand why um, this article would have been written. And, um, and after that, we started getting calls from book writers, authors doing books on cash uh, who wanted to go through the material and indeed a couple of them actually traveled all the way to Vancouver Island uh, and spent several days with me 
going through the material. Uh, when when you found all this material, did were there family members coming out of the woodwork? Like when deaths happen in in my family, we don't have much, you know, in the terms of inheritance. So it 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 seems that we handle it really well. Everybody is really good at you know, like we all give each other what we each think we need. Nobody fights over anything. Did did anybody end up fighting over this material when it's when when you were trying to make it into a documentary? No, not at all. Like I said, I was still wondering if it was um, worth enough to uh, be put in a movie, let alone whether it had any kind of value uh, mm -hmm. as memorabilia. Now, obviously, I'm not stupid. I worked in Hollywood for a long time. You know, I probably asked myself at one point, gee, I wonder how much that gold record is worth. Mm -hmm. But um, to elaborate, uh, my family is very small. In fact, my last name, Holof, is the only family in the world with that name. That's how small the family is. Um, so there was none of that kind of thing. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, how many family members were involved in the making of the documentary? Well, just about all of them, because it's such a small family. So we're not talking about a lot of people, but um, with the exception of a couple of um, cousins who, you know, had just left for their winter, you know, in Miami, because a lot of Canadian snowbirds winter in, in Florida, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, every relative uh, who lived anywhere near Toronto was involved in the movie and some of them on camera. That's great. Uh, I remember you giving credit to your co-director I, I, for the life of me. I, I had it memorized and I can't remember who, who uh, which family member was your co-director? Oh, I didn't have a co-director. I think you're talking about one of the producers. And I'm, okay, glad, yes, yes. I'm glad you brought him up. This movie would not have been made had it not been for my cousin, Jeff Pakin, who lives in uh, Burlington, Ontario and is a, a big shot in the real estate business. Um, but he was visiting LA and every time he visited, we got together and I invited him to a party and uh, at, a, at a friend's place in the Hollywood Hills. And we were outside at the pool, talk about typical Hollywood story. And, uh, you know, people were just chatting after, you know, uh, most of the people had left for the night and um, somebody asked me what I was doing. And so I started to talk about it. And uh, my cousin said, hey, do you need any help? So I really got lucky. Now, before you think I'm some rich kid uh, enjoying all the benefits of nepotism, remember I was 10 years old when my dad retired. Nobody ever picked up the phone and said, you know, give this kid a job or a job interview. Um, and, you know, I didn't even think about talking to my cousin, the real estate guy, about a documentary, but uh, as luck would have it, uh, he made it happen. I like that you say that, you know, you're not a you know, rich guy. People might, you know, I'm sure people have assumed that, the, you know, since you're, the John, since you're the son of Saul, that you had a kickstart in life or that the reason you have what you have is because you're the son. Yeah. And I don't agree with that. I, you know, even let's say good credit. I've got a friend who their parents, you know, raised them with a credit card and he had a good credit at 18, but now he's in his thirties and he still has great credit. You can't really give all the credit to the parent because he had all that chance to mess it up this entire time, you know? Right. And, Listen, I should just add a postscript to that, though, and I thank you for saying that. Um, I was a rich kid. Uh, my father was very wealthy. You know, he wasn't uh, Johnny Cash's employee. He was Johnny Cash's partner and mm. he made millions of dollars. And he retired when he was 49 years old and never worked again. And then he spent all the money on himself. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I de definitely was, uh, had a privileged childhood. There's no question about that. Yeah, uh, you know, I was actually thinking about how, how your dad kind of retired early and then went off to do his education and everything. But really, I think he did enough work in that deck or, you know, decade and a half with Johnny Cash to earn that retirement time. 
Yeah, you know uh, what, Jonathan? Uh, there's a famous line in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark that Harrison Ford um, came up with. It's not the years, it's the mileage. Yes. And that could be said about Johnny Cash and working with Johnny Cash for the 1960s and, and early 70s. So, yeah, yeah it, um, it did take a lot out of him. And uh, you know what it's like with addiction. The person with the uh, issue isn't the only person that is um, affected. It affects, of course, primarily Johnny's family, his kids, but also the people who work around him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and you know, the arrests and the scandals and 1965 just blew my mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think people, people word it as if, uh, a drug addict is a victim of addiction, but I don't think that they're the victim because it's self-induced. I believe the victims are actually the ones trying to help the one going through the addiction, you know, because oftentimes the people that make it through addictions are oftentimes people that don't need it. I've quit. I like as a, as a young adult, I, uh, I've done bad drugs. You know, I won't list them off, but it's been 13, 15 years. I didn't even remember it. I, I, you know, like I just, I couldn't even remember the life at this point. Like, so it's gone. But uh, by now I've quit cigarettes and even sugar at some point. And those were the, those, I will say those two were the hardest, but that, uh, that makes you more accomplished than me. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. Yeah. I appreciate that in addiction wise, at least, you know, I'll say, but, uh, but I've never needed the help. Like I've never gone to NA. I've never gone to rehab. You know, I think the people that actually quit are the people that are able to do it by themselves, which doesn't create so many victims, you know? Sorry. I love the father, my father and the man in black. I love it for, because it tells the story in a different sense in that way. It really is describing the actual victims of the story behind the man in black, you know? And I, I just, I'm so impressed with your father in the sense that he i said it last interview and in a realization i didn't even know much of the story but i remember realizing that your father was really the reason for johnny black's success in general sorry johnny black johnny johnny cash and uh i think at first i was calling him a businessman but i think he was really he, you could tell by his slogan he was a salesman and i i know a couple like really good salesmen it's a type of personality and i think he had it well thank you for that and you know uh, you're right uh, it's important to point out, I think that, um, you know, talent managers in the 1960s were very different from talent managers today. Um, they not only produced often the concerts themselves, but they always traveled with their artist. And in addition to putting Johnny Cash with June Carter, Saul is credited with convincing Cash to switch producers which uh, then allowed Columbia to bless the live recording at, at uh, Folsom Prison. He talked Johnny into San Quentin after Johnny followed up uh, the Monster Folsom uh, record with um, all original songs about Jesus. And uh, finally, um, probably his uh, dogged, single-minded pursuit of getting Johnny his own television show. Of all the content in the locker, how much of it made it into the documentary? Well, certainly not all of it. Yeah. Uh, just to give you um, a simple answer, um, the DVD, and uh, just for you, you guys out there in the audience, it, it used to be a round disc that people put in a machine uh, to watch movies, has 20 minutes of deleted scenes. And uh, that's just the stuff that um, I thought I could get in, but couldn't, rather than the stuff I just left out because I didn't think it would make it in. So there's a, a huge amount of material. I love buying the actual DVD. I actually bought this on YouTube so that I could listen to it at work. Uh, so I bought the documentary on YouTube because I, I have YouTube read so I can actually close the screen and have my headphones in. And that's where I do most of my research is I, I paint industrially, so I don't have to think while I work. So I get to learn uh, chemistry and physics and everything while I'm at work. I'm really enjoying that. Fantastic. But uh, I really like getting hard copy DVDs for the exact reason. I, I like watching commentary almost more than I like the movie. <laughs> you know, I watch the movie and then watch commentary and deleted sings. Like, like I love that part about it. And it really saddens me in the whole Netflix area era, you know, where you, you really miss out on a lot in that. 
I'm totally with you there. Uh, where is the archive located now? Well, in 2016, uh, my family and I donated all of the material to the University of Victoria, which uh, you mentioned earlier that my father retired at 50 uh, to go back to school because he had dropped out of school in grade nine in the middle of the Great Depression to, you know, get jobs to help feed his family. And then he enlisted in the Air Force. Um, so he never did get an education, and that's what he was after. And um, he graduated with an honors BA in history from UVic in 1983. And the university always held a special place in his heart. And so we donated everything to UVic. And in 2018, they launched the Saul Holoff Archives. That's really cool. I, I love that your dad went back to education. And in fact, I'm, I, it's, it's so odd, my journey ed, ed, like in the educational aspect, because I dropped out of high school when I was in ninth grade. I've always been learning, though. I've always had like the knack to, you know, go to Google and learn. And now I uh, belong to a website called brilliant.org, which is pretty much an online school. And I'm, I'm quote unquote, self-educating at the moment. And I'm loving every minute of it. My mind is bright. It's fast. Uh, I'm better in conversation. Uh, so many, I'm better at reading and spelling. You know, like so many things are improving and I'm sticking mostly with math, which is I think the reason why I'm feeling so much, you know, improvement. Well, you and Sol have that in common. For, in the process of making the documentary, could you briefly describe like, you know, from script to final edit, like uh, sure. the major processes? Sure. Um, the caveat being that I was just learning these things then. I may sound like an expert now, but it was all new to me. But um, there is one truism when it comes to the difference between a narrative, uh, like a Hollywood drama or whatever, and a documentary. They both you know, generally follow the usual three act structure, but unlike a narrative where, you know, most of the effort is in principal photography, um, the writing of a documentary um, and the shaping of the story uh, really happens in the edit. So I talked earlier about the two years it took me to organize the material, to reference scan everything in an, into a database, uh, you know, outline treatments. I hasten to add, by the way, Jonathan, that um, my first treatment or, you know, what we used to call a one sheet, which is basically just the log line, the synopsis, and then a long synopsis, um, I sent to a couple of friends of mine for feedback, including a dear friend in LA uh, and a very successful uh, screenwriter named Donald Martin. And uh, he wrote me back and he said, um, this is all good, but you need to write this movie from your point of view and you need to put the suicide at the top. I had it at the end, you know, I was thinking very linear, um, you know, he was born here, he managed Johnny Cash here, he died there. Um, at that particular juncture, I was just still learning, even though I had spent, you know, 15 years as a producer type in television, this was my first time writing and directing. And worst of all, um, not only did I make the mistake of doing a feature film as my first film, as opposed to what you're told to do, and that is make a short film first, I also made the toughest kind of film in the world to make, and it's called a first person documentary. In other words, I'm telling the story and I didn't want to be on camera and I didn't want, I didn't think anybody would care to listen to my problems and spend, you know, 15 bucks and on popcorn and movie tickets to do it. But he convinced me that that was where the heart of the story lay. And so basically it went from outline to uh, screenplay to, you know, tons of edits. But again, getting back to the whole idea that the story and uh, the film is shaped in the edit suite, um, the edit took two years. Principal photography was 
like 12 days. The edit took two years. And um, so that was the process. Yeah. And uh, so you, like you're saying, this is a little different because you don't really know exactly how everything's going to structure it out. So did you get all the, did you kind of get the main idea before you started filming the cutscenes, or did you have to film the cutscenes as you were figuring out the, the whole thing? Oh no, I had a, a completely locked screenplay. Oh, um, good. Oh, cool. Okay. You, you need that before you can, you can, you know, expose film as they used to say or or what do they say now roll tape or roll yeah roll your computer chip <laughs> yeah you gotta start recording um, yeah <laughs> you know on the one hand i um i did it the hard way like i mentioned before shooting film dramatic recreations sound stages location you know night for day day for night you know wet downs the whole thing but it was actually a terrifically joyous and fun and everybody just really gelled uh, on the actual principal photography and I thought at that point god I love directing this is my favorite thing in the world mm -hmm. and by the way I should add that I had the great advantage of not recording sound so you know when you're shooting on location and when you're shooting on a sound stage and you don't have to record sound it makes things, you know, orders of magnitude easier. Absolutely. Yeah, so there was this screenplay, but, you know, in the edit, I realized it didn't work in terms of the um, chronology of, uh, of the story. So that was a huge problem. And also I ended up with a rough cut that was close to three hours long and I was aiming for 90 minutes. How so when I asked this, how involved were you? Obviously, you were there the whole time during the process, but uh, like how many jobs did you uh, did you take during the the making of it? Were you editor, filmer, you know, everything? You know, uh, this is the you know, the other mistake I made and that I'm not making on my new film, and that is I did do everything. Now, I don't mean to say everything uh, at the um at you know to to discount the incredible um work of a team that numbered over 100 employees at one point but i was producer director writer uh production accountant uh publicist um i mean i did way way too much yeah uh, I'm sure you did a lot of the business aspect too, uh, yeah, promoting you know, making yeah. the money and having to figure out, you know, the tax credits and all of the oh, machinations yeah. of film and television production. Mm -hmm. Um, what part of the process was most difficult to get through in your opinion? Well, you know, that would have been the edit. Um, and, uh, oh, I remember what I was going to say earlier. I mentioned that I absolutely love shooting the film and I decided, gee, you know, I want to be a director for the rest of my life to actually falling more in love with editing. Um, I just, I mean, it was so hard. It was the hardest part. It was grueling. You know, I was drinking like a fish and I, I was gaining weight and I didn't look good and I didn't sound good. Uh, you know, I was already pretty much that way by the time we you know were shooting in those scenes in the movie you know i've got a gut on me that i never had before and, and never since but um the editing was um just so creative i really hadn't realized not only what uh an art form it is and how creative and rewarding it is but also again, that serendipity. I can't tell you how many times I was able with my editor to cover a mistake or to make something work just with the materials we had because we didn't have the money to go back for reshoots or to, mm -hmm. you know, for costly mistakes. We had to live with it and figure it out. So how much in depth do you have to understand every job, even if you hired somebody else to do it? Are there some jobs where you completely have no idea what was going on and you absolutely had to trust? Or did you understand almost everything going on? 
I'm smiling and uh, because that's such a great question. Um, and you know, um, a lot of Hollywood types don't tell you the truth. You know, they want you to think it's some big mystery and uh, you have to be a rocket scientist. So I'll tell you the straight dope. Um, on the one hand, it is true that in getting my first film made, I had to learn a ton of shit. Uh, I did a lot of reading, watched a lot of videos, met a lot of people, attended a lot of uh, workshops and, you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, attended the, the, the markets. By markets, I mean there are certain film festivals in North America that also have markets as part of the event where you go and you, you pitch uh, buyers and so on and so forth. So I studied up on, on everything. But the funny thing is, when I yelled action on the set that first day, I didn't have a clue um, <laughs> what everybody was really supposed to do. Um, and the funny thing is that um, they know it too. Um, there's, you know, every business you're in, uh, that people are in, there's a certain culture um, that grows up around that business. and. Uh, what the culture around mo making movies in, say, a soundstage is that the director is treated like the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Like suddenly people are opening doors for you. They're yelling quiet on the set. They're saying, you know, make way, make way whenever you want to walk to another set or, you know, the bathroom or whatever. So they're there to basically make what your vision happen. Now, I got really lucky. And I say lucky because I'm not that smart. And, you know, my personality probably rubs most people the wrong way. But I did one thing that seemed to just, and I didn't do it really on purpose, but I did one thing that just turned uh, the key. And that is the first day we were on the soundstage. We'd already done, I don't know, four or five days of, of location shooting, you know, the car to car stuff, the exteriors, that kind of stuff. But the first day on the soundstage with the entire crew, you know, there's a wardrobe department, carpentry, the whole works. Before we even um, did our first setup, I asked that we gather the troops in the studio. And I basically reintroduced myself and I said, you know, this might be a little unusual for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a first person story. And so this is about me and my dad. And the other thing is I've never done this before. But the one thing I did that really turned them on and I didn't do it to turn them on, but I mentioned we did not record sound. Mm. And so the way that I paced the shooting of those scenes, because as you know, Jonathan, um, they're under, you know, a phone call between Johnny and Saul or Saul talking into his audio diary late at night, drinking scotch, whatever it was, I played back the audio on the stage mm -hmm. just so that for pacing reasons. So I thought, I should play them some of the audio before we even start shooting so they get an idea about the story. Yep, and yep. So, you know, they're listening to Johnny Cash in 1972 on the phone with my dad, and they're going, hey, this is not just another lifetime movie of the week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so they had a vested interest all of a sudden. I didn't do it for that reason. You know, I wasn't trying to win friends and influence people. I was trying to tell them, you know, this is what we're trying to do. But the audio really captured their hearts and their motivations. At any point of the process of making this documentary, did you feel that there was a moment where it wasn't going to happen? Like even like halfway through the production where you're just like, wow, this is it's just not working out. I don't know how it's going to finish. Uh, well, the short answer is every other day, uh, <laughs> but um, less so, you know, when we got to principal photography, you know, you never believe that it's going to happen, or at least I didn't believe 
most of the time that it would happen until we were, you know, on the set. Uh, I kept thinking someone would come in with a hook and drag me off the straight off the stage. Um, but mostly, you know, in the years leading up to principal photography, raising the money and writing the script and learning the process and, you know, figuring things out every other day, I thought, you know, I need a job with an income, you know, I need to get a, a freaking job. Uh, when I was watching your, your documentary, the photos in that was really impressive. How Thanks. you rendered them to 3D. Uh, yeah, you know, some people call them treatments. Um, they're visual effects as opposed to special effects, which are done in camera or VFX. And so you're referring to photos where, you know, Johnny's in a black and white photo from the 1960s, but looks like he's about to strum his guitar because his arm moves slightly. Or Saul is smoking a cigarette and you can see the smoke rising from a cigarette. I stole all those ideas from an award-winning documentary that really turned me on that I saw while I was preparing to make that film called The Kid Stays in the Picture. I highly recommend it. It's about a famous dude who ran Paramount Studios. And it was the first documentary, as far as I know, that really went uh, all in with that kind of thing. That isn't Ken Burns. You know, Ken Burns is all about static pictures, uh, that the camera moves over and mm. often those pictures aren't even, um, you know, fixed um, or um, what we used to call, what do we, uh, airbrushed or whatever it used to be. But that being said, uh, yeah, you cut that. Now today, everybody can do it on their desktop. Uh, yeah. 10 years ago, it was still new. Um, that work is farmed out in this case to uh, a company in Toronto called 601 that's run by three young guys, two brothers and, and a buddy of theirs. And they are responsible for all of those uh, treatments in the movie. And uh, they did a fantastic job. I completely, and it was all over the movie too. They didn't just do one or four. It was, it, there must've been something like 30 to 50 Yes, photos to be honest did. with you, uh, Jonathan, there were too many, and that's my advice to you. If you're going to do it, do it sparingly. Okay. Uh, for one cost, but I, I, I don't know if it was a distraction. I wouldn't. I, th I loved it. I'm glad. <laughs> I'll add that uh, fan, fan moment there. Cheers, man. Did you consider this a form of therapy for you during, because you were just going through a really rough and confusing time, changing, you know, changing your career, you know, and almost your entire life changed during that time. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, that's how it started, right? You know, it was not going to be a book or a movie. It was just me in a storage locker in the middle of winter after my father killed himself trying to figure it all out. So yeah, it was a form of therapy. And obviously, well, if it's not obvious, the whole process was very cathartic. You know, I was able to find empathy for my father and that led to forgiveness so you really experienced a hero's journey through that whole thing like the, the the hollywood hero journey there well it's it's thank you for saying that but uh, that's the thing you know even if it's a documentary you're still kind of hewing to that uh hero's journey which is you know where the bible comes from mm -hmm. it, yeah and pretty much every story that means something at least <laughs> right and the cool thing is going through these audio files and I mean, that was actually your dad's form of his own therapy was, I, I assume, recording these, uh, all of this and keeping that, the book that you found called Life, which is a, like a scrapbook of uh, everything that he felt valuable, at least. Right. You know, um, we're talking about a 1960s archetypical man, you know, back in those days, it was taboo to visit a psychiatrist and um and so he did kind of do therapy although i don't know if he realized how what he was doing or what the effect might have but he was a guy who liked to keep records and uh and it's a good thing he did or there wouldn't have been any movie but at the end of the day 
what I found, uh, and the reason I was able to find that empathy for my father is because when I was growing up, you know, he was um, uh, a hard man, you know, um, he wasn't a touchy feely kind of guy. He, he said on tape that at one point that if it all happened over again, he wouldn't have children. That was hard to hear. But you know, what I learned for the first time in meeting my father before he was my father, this is a guy speaking into a microphone at age 40, and I'm the same age, I was the same age hearing it for the first time, um, was to meet your parents before they were your parents and to find out for the first time that my father did have an emotional life. He did register all these things that were going on that I thought he was oblivious to and didn't care. Meanwhile, he was a tortured soul who was just trying to figure things out like all of us. Do you find yourself keeping things in sentimental reasons in the same sense that your dad did? I wouldn't use the word sentimental because uh, I don't think uh, I've got a lot of that. I don't think Saul, well, he, yeah, no, I don't think Saul had a lot of that either. Um, it's, I think it comes from another place, uh, personality traits, people who, you know, might go into uh, law or become an accountant, you know, people who are organized and, you know, balance their checkbook are the types that, you know, keep things, right? But it's interesting you ask, I always was that way. I, you know, I had a successful business uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, but it wasn't until I became a documentary filmmaker that I really started to, um, to do it without really realizing, you know, uh, what was going on. Just to be specific, after the movie, uh, that led to a book. And the book led to a university archive. And the university archive led to a nationally televised tribute to my dad on television. And through it all, I have been, you know, keeping his story organized and adding to it as these things happen and learning new things and realizing belatedly that something I thought was meaningless, like a moose hunt in Newfoundland, turns out to be probably the most important story of all. So yeah, let's go into that. Uh, what is your pro current project now? Well, this uh, moose story, you know, it's kind of like uh, a fishing story in, the, in a sense that it's this big. Um, I knew about the uh, moose hunt. Um, we're talking about the 1961 uh, Newfoundland moose hunt and concert tour. Um, I knew about it because that was where my father and Johnny Cash shook hands on, uh, uh, on being Johnny's manager. They had been working together for a couple of years. Saul was um, producing Cash shows in Canada since 1958. But Johnny tapped Saul to be his manager uh, in October 1961. His career had faltered. You know, Elvis had crossed over to popular audiences. Cash had not. Um, he hadn't charted really uh, in any serious way for two years. And um, he wanted Saul to be his manager. And, and uh, they, you know, talked about it for weeks. And uh, while they talked about it, Saul thought that he could impress Johnny by setting up this tour in Newfoundland because he knew Johnny liked to hunt. And uh, so they show up in Newfoundland and we're talking about a cast of, uh, of country and Western royalty, Merle Travis. Um, let's see who else, Rose Maddox, Johnny Western. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it's a fantastic story. And it's what led to Saul calling June Carter because when he agreed to manage Johnny, he had his own conditions. You know, Johnny had just gotten a drummer at that point. Saul was always complaining, uh, how can you be serious and not have a drummer? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when he started with Johnny, it was Johnny Cash and the Tennessee Two. 
And so when Johnny asked him to manage him, Saul basically said, look, I want to put you on big stages uh, like Carnegie Hall and the Hollywood Bowl. At the time, you know, he was playing clubs and, you know, high school gymnasiums and shit like that. Um, and Saul said, we need a bigger show. We need more than just you and your band. And so he hired Rose Maddox. And I'll let you guys look up who Rose Maddox was, but she was a great. Uh, but she quit in the middle of the tour in Newfoundland saying that the, um, the boys were just too wild for her. And uh, that's what led uh, two weeks later to Johnny and June and uh, Ring of Fire and all the way to Folsom Prison and beyond. It was a very dangerous situation up there on the Newfoundland tour. Cash, of course, was taking pills and had to leave the show for a while. It was a situation where his boys were just giving out. They asked me to do that final spot on the show. Uh, I was recording for Columbia Records at that time, and the second highest rated television show in the world was Have Gun, Will Travel. They told me that I was playing to 350 million people a week with that theme song of that show. So the people in the audience were familiar with me for that particular thing. Working with Johnny, I usually introduced him on all the shows. So we had an extremely close relationship, and he always felt that I could jump in if necessary. That made it very easy for me to do the fill-in for Johnny when he was not able to perform on those dates. Or in fact, some of the pictures that I have seen of that particular tour of the Moose Hunt shot from behind with the back of the stage and then looking at the audience. It is me at the microphone. Harry Walters was the uh, director of wildlife when he called me and asked me if I would uh, be interested in guiding Johnny Cash. I was in Millertown doing research on moose. They picked me up at Lake Ambrose and uh, we proceeded to the camp. We stayed in a logging camp that had closed for the season. The first thing I remember in the morning was uh, Merle Travis asking us to get out of the sleeping bags and enjoy his coffee. Merle Travis was the gem of the crew. He was uh, witty, always had a joke, sang a lot of his songs. Luther was one in a million. You didn't know if he was uh, a millionaire or a bum. Luther was Luther wherever he went. He was loved, not well liked, he was loved. What I remember so well about Gordon Terry was that he was a very beautiful singer. I can't remember ever hearing anyone that I thought was better. And he loved to sing. And my thoughts was that this guy is really going to go to the top. But I, I learned after that he was uh, famous as a violin player. All aboard with that four five girls, that ain't right. Ain't right. I don't sparkle like a blue light pearls, that ain't right. Ain't right. All the girls are real cute tricks, that ain't right. Ain't right. Hell, what about me? I'll get me a fix, that ain't right. Saul Olaf was a very highly respected guy, really, because we do. He was uh, Johnny Cash's manager. He was a great guy to be with. Always had time to sit talk to you, and played his part in washing dishes too. <laughs> but Johnny Cash and I was the same age, twenty nine, I believe. We almost became immediately friends because everything we talked about, we both had a common ground into it. It was a dream of a lifetime to, you know, when I think of it. I remember so much about it simply because I enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, 
Uh, how did you come across this content, the story, and why didn't it make it into the original documentary? That's a great question. Um, like I said, I knew about the trip because the first thing I ever had to do in order to make a film like this or any documentary was I had to basically develop a calendar. Um, that's a simple way of saying a database uh, organizing all of the material chronologically and with keywords and everything else. And I saw that moose hunt on the list and you know, I had the approximate dates and I knew it was about 10 days long and there are letters where Saul and Johnny are talking about the moose hunt, uh, going to Newfoundland. They had a big meeting. Johnny wanted Saul to renegotiate his deal at Columbia Records in New York City, which they did literally the day before they left for uh, Newfoundland. And so I knew about it, but the thing uh, the reason it didn't make it in the film is because it's a film, and if you don't have pictures, you know, uh, it's not really going to rise to the top of, of the material you're working with. And I didn't really understand uh, the importance of the story at that time. In fact, I didn't even know all those people were on that tour, including and especially Johnny's longtime friend and my dad's friend, Johnny Western, who is one of our primary contributors in the new film and he's got the dope you know he brings the receipts and uh, it's just fascinating oh and sorry i didn't answer your question why now well last summer someone in newfoundland a fan discovered 30 new photographs of the hunt and they're not just new and they're not just beautiful but it turns out we found out a little later they were taken by a famous Life magazine photographer uh, known for his spreads on Clark Gable and John F. Kennedy. Do you have a lot of people trying to reach out to you, giving you more information? Does this situation happen often these days? No. And, um, you know, it came as a, a complete surprise. Um, you know, I've often thought about making another film. Um, you know, part of that there's all sorts of um, variables, obviously, but part of that is the, the, the main part of that is the idea for a film. And, you know, I have started work on a bunch of ideas that just didn't cut it. Um, and if you had asked me if I'd make another film about Johnny Cash, I would have said, heavens, no. Mm. Um, so it was a huge surprise. This fan uh, had heard about me or read about me. Uh, online. And uh, he basically just called me up and said, you know, here, do something with these. And uh, it was basically like, um, you know, winning the lottery in that set in a storyteller sense, because mm -hmm. without those photos, and you know, in a in the final 90 minutes, you know, those photos, there are 30 by the famous uh, uh, Richard Dick Frisky, and there are 17 candid ones also new from Johnny's hunting guide, Heeman Whalen. Uh, but then you have all of my dad's archive at the university. So in the final 90 minutes, there's going to be hundreds of photos. Uh, but these photos are key, obviously. And uh, if they weren't so good, uh, I don't think I would have even thought of uh, making another film. This was really the start of Johnny Western's story with them. It wasn't it this, this particular story? For the first couple of years, it was just Johnny Marshall Grant and Luther Perkins. And then some promoter like my dad must have told them, look, you know, we need a few more characters on this uh, in the cast. And so Johnny added Johnny Western and Gordon Terry. And um, so there were, you know, and then Fluke came aboard in 62. So there, there were like five of them, uh, pardon me, six of them by the time uh, uh, Johnny tapped Saul to manage him. And that's when Saul uh, hired Rose Maddox. And mm. because of that weird moose hunt, um, turned around and, and replaced her with June Carter. Mm -hmm. uh, when can we expect the release of this new documentary? 
Well, it's still, it's just getting started at this point. So I can't say for sure, but I have reason to believe that we're talking fall 2022. Okay. Uh, I guess since you're still in the project for this, this might be a hard question to ask, but after this, uh, what's next for you in your career? Are you planning on going back to Hollywood or do you think um, you're going to try to do more filmmaking on your own? Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I, I was about to say something and will say something that's terribly uncharacteristic of me, but, you know, I didn't see this coming. So, you know, something might just come along as a consequence of this, you yeah. know, maybe now uh, with, a, with a second film, somebody will actually say, you know, you would be good to direct this uh, for somebody else. Uh, you never know. But I have no plans except hoping someday to retire. And no, I'm not ever going back to um, to Hollywood. And um, and you know, I I wouldn't travel there at least during the Trump administration either. Uh, right now, uh, what's your favorite movie out right now? And it could be old. You know, it could be at any moment. Like uh, I typically base my favorite movies on how many times I've watched it and enjoyed it. But. Uh, Oh what man, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go with that definition, um, my answer's pretty boring and uh, and it would be on everybody's top 10 list, Shawshank Redemption. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, what movie were you most impressed with while watching either visual or you know factual or you know just you know it took you out of your reality? What movie what, I guess that would be probably the same movie in that in this. But what were you most impressed with? Well, I think you're right about that. If you mean that, um, and remember, you know, that depends on on when uh, you saw the movie, um, mm -hmm. because uh, my answer doesn't necessarily mean that it's more impressive than something I saw last week by Christopher Nolan. But um, to answer your question, the first thing I thought of again was that documentary, The Kid Stays in the Picture. You should check it out. Okay, cool. Definitely. I'll put a link. I'll put a that actual reference that in the description of this video as well. Sure. Uh, on that note, I'm gonna actually put links to other interviews that you've had on this and other subjects that we like other interviews that you know painted a light that I did not go into. I think that'd be valuable as well. If 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 you don't mind, I'd like to recommend one, and the reason I do this only because I I just stumbled across it yesterday because YouTube, you know, just automatically plays next video mm -hmm. and I, I hadn't seen this in 10 years but I did an interview with BBC radio and it's on my YouTube page so if you're going to do some links that would be a good one to include okay cool uh, okay that's funny it's obviously I asked that I'm coming on to the end of it we can go back to walk the line or the first movie whatever you want you know what walk the line yeah well, let's talk about that for a moment i didn't like walk the line i've i sh shouldn't say that i enjoyed it but like i only watched it once and i never had a desire to keep watching it i agree with trevor is when i saw walk hard <laughs> i saw that movie much more and oh, yeah. so now when i saw when i think of walk the line it's really difficult for me to separate walk hard and walk the line now, now that I've researched more on Johnny Cash, it's a lot easier. But uh, before this week, when I look back, I actually never really wanted to talk about it because I'd be embarrassed <laughs> at referencing the wrong movie. Well, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm not going to diss Walk the Line. I, I enjoyed it uh, very much. But like you, I've seen Walk Hard many more times than Walk the Line. Having said that, um, you know, it was very well made. Um, you know, it, it, it you know, captured some of the um, Johnny and June um, magic. Um, I am a huge fan of Joaquin Phoenix. Um, you know, Reese did a, a good job, but it wasn't really a stretch because she grew up in Tennessee idolizing June Carter. So, uh, but she was a very, she was very well cast. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the director did a marvelous job. Um, it's first class. Uh, from beginning to end. Um, but, you know, uh, it's a movie. And uh, in these kinds of interviews, I'm also asked, you know, what did you think of the movie 
as a representation of the story. And, um, you know, again, I'm not pretending to be smarter than I am. I really just only, I, and I worked in Hollywood for 10 years before I ever started uh, thinking about these kinds of things. But let's remember most of us, including me at that stage, go to movies and, you know, we may see that disclaimer at the top of the film that says based on a true story. Mm -hmm. uh, it really should read based loosely on a true story. I mean, yeah, I think they're, they're taking a whole entire life and compressing it in less than two hours. Um, so, you know, something's got to give. That's not a criticism. That's just the reality of, of you know, uh, I'm not going to say fiction, but it was a narrative film. It wasn't nonfiction. It's not a documentary. And, you know, different events were compressed together and, and certain things were left out. And so, you know, it was a great movie and I couldn't have done better. Me neither. And, uh, you know, and vocally I, I sing and uh, I can I've got a lower toned voice and I can get those lower Johnny Cash notes. But I, I think you know, Mr. Phoenix did a really good job on that because I don't think he has that natural low voice. And I think he had to gain it, which I'm impressed with. Yeah, it's plus, a lot easier to gain the highs and the lows. Plus, he's a little guy. I mean, Johnny yeah. six two. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he really had that uh, larger than life presence to him. Uh, that pretty much wraps it up. I, I want to relate a little bit in the sense that uh, in in the, the religious aspect in the relationship between your father and Johnny, me and my cousin Trevor, who uh, who was also in the last interview, we are partners in everything uh, in in music production and this in this type thing as well. Uh, and we are very big into the community. We work together very, very well, but he is the most religious of anybody I know. And I am the absolute opposite. I think it's really funny. If, if we were to keep text messages, like if we would have had letters like them, it, the funny thing is he always ends it with God bless you. And I'll always end it with God's not real, you know, like, or something along those lines. It's like, it's a, it's an actual, it, it, we, we literally joke about it. It's not a big deal, but I, right. I, 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 I relate. How old that. are you, Jonathan? I'm 33. Okay, well, keep in mind that not only did religious people kill people like us, it wasn't that long ago. And remember that in 1973, when Johnny and Saul broke up, um, you know, I don't think Saul ever even used the word atheist, you know, even in private conversation, it, at at friends' parties, anything like that. Um, it was, you know, really on the down low. So, you know, things are changing slowly. It's only taken 2,000 years to start realizing the earth is round. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I am for separation of church and planet. So where can we find your, where can we find you on YouTube? On, do you have a website? Where can we find you if we want to find anything you're, you know any news or anything like that thank you yeah i'm um i'm uh that guy uh with only that name so you're not gonna have to worry about uh how many hollis to go through before you find me and i'm on facebook you know youtube um and if you're wondering about uh my first film my father the man in black you can find that everywhere with the only exception being netflix ironically nice well i appreciate you joining me this has been a pleasure uh researching you and i've learned i've learned things about myself during this and i really appreciate it i had a great time with this interview be sure to watch the documentary my Father and the Man in Black. I recommend buying the DVD to get the bonus footage. I'm gonna put links to interviews with Jonathan on other channels, a link to the recommended documentary, The Kid Stays In, and a link to keep updated on the upcoming documentary, When Johnny Got His Moose. This channel is new, so every like and every subscription makes a massive difference. So please consider liking and consider subscribing.